When exploring mountain ranges, one of the really big frustrations can be the weather. Mountains are magnets for bad weather. This phenomenon is called orographic rainfall. You also know that in places like Scotland, the west coast is wetter than the east. It's to do with the prevailing wind directions. Well, orographic rainfall does more than just make mountaineers wet. We'll see that it also makes the mountains themselves. So let's start off with this simple idea of thickening the crust. So we've got a side view of a crustal profile. The deformation is driven by the maximum compressive stress being horizontal, but it's being resisted by the vertical stress, which is imposed by the gravitational load, not only by the topography that's created by the deformation, but also by the buoyancy of the thickened crust. So the deformation will be able to continue for as long as the tectonic stress outcompetes the vertical stress. But when these two stresses become more equal, there'll be no driving force for the deformation. So it can either stop, or if the adjacent crust is able to yield, the deformation can continue in this adjacent area, and the deformation can migrate. Well, this notion is captured in the concept of the thin viscous sheet model for crustal deformation, models developed by Philip Inglis and Greg Hausman a long time ago now in the 1980s. They applied this model to understand the Tibetan plateau. So as some strong lithosphere encounters weak lithosphere, it drives in as an indenter, thickening the weaker crust, creating elevation that's a plateau. And they model this numerically. Their results are shown here. The deformation is seen in plan view. And we can chart the strain by just tracking crustal thickness as the indenter drives into what is at the moment just 30 kilometer thick crust. Here we go, a bit thicker, and the deformation migrates out, and we end up with thicker crust, and the deformation has migrated into the previously underformed material, creating a wider and wider area of thickened crust. Let's look at this in this cartoon here. So again, we're going to deform a profile of crust, and the topography that's created is resisting further deformation. It's an example of work hardening. But what if we add erosion? So here we've got some rain falling. And if that rainfall can erode the surface and we can flush away the eroded products, the detritus, we release the topographic load so that deformation can continue. And we can create heterogeneous strain, variations in the crustal deformation, if the erosion is also heterogeneous, so if the rain is only falling on one part of our model here. Well, let's explore this by looking at some natural examples. Let's zoom in on New Zealand. New Zealand lies on the plate boundary between the Pacific plate on the right and the Australian plate on the left. But it also lies surrounded by oceans, particularly the Tasman Sea on the west. And it's this direction that the weather comes from. But more of that in a minute. Let's zoom in to this area here in South Island, New Zealand. It's a really spectacular landscape. The Tasman Sea is over there on the left-hand side of the image, and the Pacific is over the horizon to the east. And forming the spine of South Island are the Southern Alps. The Southern Alps are defined by a major fault zone on their western side. It's a structure called the Alpine Fault, which dips back under the Southern Alps. It's an oblique thrust. And the weather comes from the west. So let's see what that means for rainfall. We're going to plot some annual rainfall totals across a profile. And there's an orange scale bar for two metres, so that's two metres of rainfall a year. Now that's quite a lot of rainfall. The little yellow bar on the side there is the annual rainfall for Christchurch, which lies over on the east coast of South Island. That sort of amount of rainfall 
is very similar to the annual rainfall for Aberdeen, for example. Well, what about over on the west coast? Well, over on the west coast, there's about three and a half metres of rainfall a year. Incidentally, that's about the same annual rainfall as the wettest inhabited place in Britain, which is Seathwaite in Cumbria. But our story doesn't finish there, because that's the rainfall at sea level on the west side of South Island. Let's add some other values. And as we go up into the Southern Alps, the rainfall increases really dramatically. So along the spine of the Southern Alps, the rainfall can exceed an amazing 15 metres a year. Of course, that's precipitation because much of that falls as snow, which drives the glaciers that erode the Southern Alps. But look how asymmetric this rainfall is. As you go to the east of the crest of the Southern Alps, into Otago, the rainfall drops away significantly until right over on the east coast we're down at that value at Christchurch of less than a meter a year. So asymmetric rainfall. So here's how the rainfall maps onto a crustal cross section through South Island New Zealand. You can see the Alpine fault there, a northwest directed thrust, and the topography which is the Southern Alps. And the erosion is strongly asymmetric. Erosion in response to this difference in the annual rainfall across the island. So the Southern Alps are attracting more rainfall and that rainfall is driving erosion but it also drives the deformation. And this effect was explored further by Chris Beaumont's group in the early 1990s. This shows the results of some numerical models showing deformation of some yellow rocks there driving up a thrust ramp. The trajectories taken by material is shown by the red lines and by the yellow arrows. And this shows the deformation when there's no erosion. The deformation is limited by topography. But if we build differential erosion on the left hand side, the deformation also focuses on this left or western side, if you put this in a context of New Zealand. So where you have erosion in this system changes where the deformation localises. Well, let's move to Tibet and the Himalayas. On this Google Earth satellite image, the really interesting part about this is the colour because all that beige material over on the Tibetan plateau tells you that it is arid. It's also got only internal drainage. So even the, if there is erosion in here, the sedimentation isn't taken away from the plateau. It just stays on there in those little lakes and so forth, just locally ponding. So that area is not eroding. In contrast, the Himalayas very much are. So here's a cartoon cross-section through there, the Tibetan plateau and the Tibetan crust is shown in the orange, the Indian side of the Himalayas shown in the pink. Well let's step back a bit and put this onto a different type of cartoon. So this shows a vertically exaggerated cartoon representing the topography as we go across the region. Tibetan plateau, five or so kilometres above sea level, very limited relief, so not much difference in the topography as you go across the plateau. Contrast, the Himalayas, of course, have got some of the greatest relief on the planet. High mountains, but also very deep cut valleys. And then as you go out onto the Indian side, on the left-hand side of this diagram, you have the Fallen Basin, which is an area of active subsidence. Worth pointing out that the peaks in the Himalayas are compensated for by the deep valleys. So the reason you can have the high peaks isostatically is because some of the topographic load here is removed by erosion in the deep valleys. So the erosion is what's creating the high topography of the Himalayas, or at least allowing it to occur. Let's put on a schematic 
crustal thickness under here as well. A different vertical scale, so we can have that on the same diagram. So the weather in this region is primarily from the south. For example, the Indian monsoon, which sweeps out of the Bay of Bengal and up into the Himalayas from the southern side, meaning that Tibet is a rain shadow. And the effect of that is that the Himalayas are able to erode really effectively by precipitation in the Himalayas, the glaciers cutting into the mountains, shedding sediment into the river systems, and then critically flushing away from the Himalayas and out into the adjacent oceans. So returning to the satellite image, the weather is coming from here, which allows the Himalayas to erode and the sediment to flush out down the river systems and out, out away from the system. So remarkably then, it's where the rain falls that is dictating the mountain ranges in the Himalayas versus Tibet and in the Southern Alps of New Zealand. Maybe next time that you're in the mountains and complaining about the bad weather, maybe reflect a while and remember that maybe those mountains are there because of the rainfall itself. Tectonics modulated by surface processes.